Mr. President. The Senator from New Jersey. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'd like to ask uh, for unanimous consent that the privileges of the floor be granted to the following member of my staff, uh, Aaron Robinson. Without objection. Uh, I'm grateful for that. And I know the night is, is going on. I just want to take a moment to uh, express my appreciation to all the staff members when senators remain on the floor here. A lot of folks who work here uh, from the gentleman here typing very quickly uh, all the way to a lot of the folks working. I just want to express my gratitude for the long night, particularly to the pages. It is their second week uh, here, and they suddenly are being forced to grapple with not just school, but the uh, long nights of the United States Senate, and I really do respect them, and, and I'm grateful for um, their, uh, how should I say, endurance uh, tonight as well. I uh, rise today, as many of my colleagues have, to speak uh, to the nomination of Betsy DeVos, to speak specifically in opposition uh, to her nomination to serve as Secretary of Education. Uh, I've listened to as much of my colleagues' words as I, as I can, and I uh, want to say that particularly those on the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committees, they have all and will and continue to expand upon many of the concerning elements of Mrs. DeVos's record. Uh, concerns that I share about her lack of support for critical accountability measures, her lack of familiarity with many of the basic financial aid policies and programs which are so essential uh, for people to have access to higher education, uh, her inability to say that guns should not be in schools, and her seeming lack of understanding of many of the fundamental yet critical education policy perspectives that I think are necessary for a job of this magnitude. I know there's been much said, uh, and there'll be many more issues brought up of concern to many of the Democrats uh, that spoke tonight. But tonight, I'd like to focus on an area that's uh, very personal to me and also very personal to millions and millions of Americans uh, that is essential to this role, but one that may not be uh, immediately understood when you talk about uh, uh, a Secretary of Education, but it is absolutely critical uh, to that department. In fact, I think it is one of the more critical roles of that department when it comes to fulfilling the ideals of our nation. Within the Department of Education is the Office for Civil Rights. And that office is profoundly important but it's one that many people don't have a full understanding. What I'd like to do right now is highlight four areas in which the Office for Civil Rights functions, as in, and also talk to as they relate to my concerns about and my opposition to Betsy DeVos to serve as Secretary of Education. First, I'd like to talk about what's at stake for children with disabilities and their families and their parents. About 13 to 14 percent of our American school-aged children, about 6.5 million kids and young adults in America, are students with a disability. Here in the United States, I am so proud that we have a deep belief, and in fact, our laws passed by people of both houses, of both parties, dictate that all children be treated with dignity and respect, and that they will get the educational opportunities that all children deserve. Indeed, our laws reflect that, but the spirit of America is to see that in this nation, all of our children have unique gifts. All of our children have beauty. And we, as a nation, collectively believe that they all deserve a strong pathway to the fundamental American ideals. They deserve pathways to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That when we say justice for all, we really do mean all children. But unfortunately, as the work of the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights demonstrates, the federal government is often at odds with some school districts who do not properly enforce protections granted to students with disabilities under the federal law, again, passed by both houses, passed 
by both parties. Within our country, thousands of parents do not believe their children are receiving justice in their local school children's school systems for ch their children with disabilities. And they reach out to the federal government for help, for relief, for that justice. Take the example of one child, the case of a nine-year-old child in California whose name I'm withholding uh, and is withheld for privacy. This child, and let's call her Jane, is a student like so many others, has the same dreams and aspirations, has hopes, has promise, has untapped, unlimited potential. At the age of nine, this child, Jane, had been physically restrained in her school more than 92 times during the 11 month period, during an 11 month period by her school because of her disability. And as a part of that restraint, she had been held face down for a total of 2,200 minutes. Now, the Office of Civil Rights at the federal level, the federal government, it took them to investigate this case and they found that the district was in violation of the federal law and required the school district to stop using these kind of restraints on students and actually take the time, energy, and invest the resources in training the staff on alternative intervention methods. Methods that recognize the dignity of that child and show that we have the potential and power to elevate that child, not to so savagely restrain them. This was not only unconscionable treatment that the federal government intervened in, but clearly it was illegal within the federal bonds of federal law. This is not the way that anyone here, anyone in this body with a child with a disability, any of us would want our children to be treated. If I had a child, I know it's not the way that I would want them treated, but frankly, when it comes to the children of America, there are children. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, we know that our children, our kids, American children, all children, frankly, deserve better than this kind of physical abuse. It's these kind of reasons that I believe we need to have an aggressive office for the civil rights. Because this story of Jane, of a nine-year-old, is not an anomaly. It's not something that is rare. Unfortunately, as we're seeing, there are many violations that go on of federal law when it comes to our children with disabilities. There's tremendous evidence that this kind of abuse still goes on in our country, and there needs to be an ultimate authority that can investigate this abuse, and if necessary, hold those people accountable who are the abusers. And the additional step that the Office for Civil Rights does is give advisement, give instruction on how to make sure the abuse does not happen in the future. We need our Office for Civil Rights to work with school districts to establish those policies and procedures to prevent that abuse. When Ms. DeVos, during her testimony, was given the opportunity to speak to the millions of parents who have real legitimate concerns about their children with disabilities and the treatment they receive in school, she was given the opportunity to speak to the vital role of the federal government in protecting our children and affirming those rights about the role of the Office for, the, for Civil Rights. Instead of talking, uh, taking that opportunity, instead of seizing the moment to talk about what she would be doing to lead, she actually denied a role for the federal government. When asked about protecting students with disabilities, she simply said it should be left up to the states. Well, I'll tell you right now, for that nine-year-old child, physically restrained more than 92 times, held face down for hours, the federal government clearly had an important role to play for that mom, for that family, for that child, in making sure that this kind of atrocity doesn't happen and won't happen for more children. 
Secondly, I'd like to talk about what's at stake for the Office of Civil Rights as it results to children who are different, whether that be the color of their skin, whether they wear a hijab to school as an expression of their faith, or if they're a minority or, again, a child with a disability. I've spoken, for example, much as a senator about the school-to-prison pipeline and often how certain categories of children experience different types of discipline for the same act in school just because of how they look. School disciplinary policies, we know, play a big role in a child's success. And if those disciplinary policies are clearly treating different children in different ways, there will be different outcomes for those categories of kids. We know that children who have out-of-school suspensions often graduate at significantly lower rates, have significantly higher run-ins with the law. I am one that believes that we cannot allow discrimination to happen in that manner in our school. And this is the facts, this is the data. Take, for example, black students are 3.8 times more likely than their white peers to receive one or more out-of-school suspensions, while students with disabilities actually are twice as likely than those without to receive one or more out-of-school suspensions. Let me give you the specific case of Tanette Powell, who wrote about her son who is black, his name is Joa. He was suspended five times in 2014. He was three years old. She said, one after another, white mothers confessed the trouble their children had gotten into. Some of the behavior was similar to JJ's, her son's. Some was much worse. Most startling to me, to her, was that none of their children had been suspended. She continues to write, after this party, where she had heard this from other white parents, I read a study reflecting everything that I was living. Black children represent 18% of preschool enrollment, but make up 48% of preschool children receiving more than one out-of-school suspension, according to a study released by the Federal Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights in March, she writes. One of the critical things about the Office for Civil Rights is that they have been proactively collecting data about differences in treatment in our schools. Now, there are many people who actively assert that the role of the Office for Civil Rights has grown too large, that they are poking around in local matters too much, that even collecting such data as was relied on by this mother is an intrusion into states' rights. But I believe when it comes to civil rights, when it comes to religious freedom and the treatment of our children, I do not believe that the Office of Civil Rights has grown too large. I believe that they are offering critical transparency into the workings of our schools that is collecting, that they are collecting data that parents and policymakers and civil rights groups can use to see who is being left behind, who might be facing discrimination, who is not receiving justice. What do we have to be afraid of even on just the collection of data to allow us ourselves to have that transparency, to create an environment of accountability? I worry that if this is not a priority for the next Secretary of Education, then closing the achievement gap, shutting down the school to prison pipeline, and empowering all children to have an equal opportunity to learn will be undermined. These are real problems in our country, and they aren't just gonna go away. And the federal government, especially when they insist upon data transparency, is an active partner in helping us to receive the justice that we deserve and need and pledge allegiance to as a country. Now, I had hoped during the hearings of Ms. DeVos that I'd hear more, that, that even if I had the opportunity 
to talk to my nominee myself, I would have asked for more information around these issues. But I didn't have that opportunity. And in the very rushed hearings, the issue wasn't raised. I believe, though, that based on the testimony that was given, that the nominee may not see this as a vital function of the Office of Civil Right for Civil Rights, and in fact may shrink that office and the ongoing proactive investigations that we see right now into such matters. And we know that the school to prison pipeline, particularly for young people of color, isn't just real, it's actually pervasive. But during Mrs. DeVos's confirmation hearing, when asked about the Office of Civil Rights within the Department of Education that is responsible for re re rectifying such unjust situations, she refused to comment. She refused to comment. She refused to commit herself even to directing the Office of Civil Rights to investigate such civil rights violations. I don't understand what is a difficult thing to even commit the department to continuing such investigations, but that commitment was denied. I want to next talk about the serious problem we have in America with sexual assault and sexual violence in schools and on college campuses. One in five women and one in 16 men are sexually assaulted in their college years. But only 1% of assailants on college campuses are arrested, charged, or convicted. We still know that too many people on college campuses who've been sexually assaulted, who are survivors, are routinely denied justice and forced to even live or even go to class with their attackers. The Office for Civil Rights has rose to this challenge and this crisis. They have opened investigations in over 200 schools in America. There is a crisis of campus sexual assault in America. And now the Office of Civil Rights expanding their work, they've stepped up to that challenge. In addition to that, They've issued guidance to all college campuses on preventing and combating sexual assault. Ms. Voss, again, during her testimony, many of us were hoping that this is an issue, she would rise to the occasion, that she would speak to this issue. She was given the chance, given a chance not just to speak to the issue, but to talk to the federal role in meeting this crisis, to acknowledge that this is an issue our nation must grapple with and must end. But she did not speak to the concerns of parents. She did not speak to the concerns of survivors. She did not speak to America about the urgent need for all of us to be engaged with dealing with a crisis for which there has been silence on too long. More than this, she did not speak to the role of the Office for Civil Rights, to the expanding role that they've been taking, to the expanding investigations in college campuses all across the country, giving no confidence to me or others that this will be a role that will continue in fact, a role that I believe should be expanded. And again, even when she was specifically asked about upholding guidance within the Department of Education on combating and preventing sexual assault, not asked to commit on the investigations, not asked to commit to expanding the efforts, but just asked about upholding the guidance within the Department of Education on combating and preventing sexual assault, she refused to commit to maintaining that guidance. I'd like to speak to another area. But before I do, I, I do believe this idea of transparency that my previous colleague talked about when it comes to donations. 
Because some of the donations that have, people have received charity from Mr. Voss have a history of fighting against efforts to combat sexual assault and worked, some of these organizations worked to make it more difficult for sexual assault victims to seek justice. And that brings me to an area in which I had a deep level of concern that I hoped that Mr. Voss would take a, the opportunity to set the record straight because much had been written before even the hearings. And this involves an area where there is a clear crisis in our country. It is a crisis involving the safety and the security of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered youth in America. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth face a stunning level of prejudice and discrimination inside and outside of school starting at a very young age. We know that LGBT youth are two times more likely than their heterosexual peers to be physically, physically assaulted in schools. LGBT youth are four times more likely to attempt suicide. According to Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 34% of LGB, lesbian, gay, and bisexual students were bullied on school property. More than a third of, the, of LGBT students were bullied on school property. 13% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual students did not go to school because of concerns for their safety. We know in America that this kind of harassment has no place in our classrooms, no place in our schools. It has no place anywhere in our country. But it is all too common and all too often unaddressed. I'd like to talk about a parent. Her name is Wendy Walsh. The harassment against Wendy's son, Seth, began for him in the fourth grade when his classmates suspected he was gay. And by the time he reached the seventh grade, the bullying, the verbal and physical abuse in person and online was so bad that he was afraid to walk home from school. His child lived in terror of just going to class. After one bullying incident in a local park, his mom says that 13-year-old Seth came home from school. She talked to him. He asked to borrow a pen from his mom. That conversation would be the last time she would see her son alive. The next time Wendy saw her son, Seth, he had hanged himself on a tree in their backyard. After Seth's death, Wendy, experiencing a level of grief and agony I cannot imagine, she decided to file a complaint with the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. When the Office for Civil Rights came in and investigated, they found that Seth's school district was in violation of several federal laws. That they failed to intervene and stop the bullying and the harassment and the tormenting that this child endured from the precious of ages until their death. That their actions could have potentially prevented the death of one of our children, of an American child, a child of beauty and of worth and of dignity and potential. 
Wendy went to the federal government, to the Office of Civil Rights, and they took her concerns seriously, and they aggressively investigated. Because of their investigation, because of Wendy's courage in her time of grief, the school district, in violation of federal laws, was required to take steps, though not there to prevent her child's death, they were required to take steps to prevent the kind of harassment and tormenting and bullying from happening to other students. I'm not sure if any of that is of solace to a mother who lost their child. I'm not sure if it gave her comfort, but I am hopeful that with an active Office of Civil Rights at the Federal Department of Education, at a time where more than 10% of our lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth are missing school because of that kind of fear, when a third are reporting bullying and harassment in person or online, at this level of unconscionable treatment for any child, there is a role for the federal government to protect our children. I believe if we take these matters seriously, that we can ensure that this kind of bullying and harassment will come to an end in America. It's unacceptable in a country this great. There are laws against this, and there are folks that have an obligation for enforcing those laws. That's the Office of Civil Rights. I believe things will get better, but they won't get better automatically because we hope for them, because we pray for it. They'll get better because we are a country that loves our children, and love is not a being verb. It demands action. And we see time and time again that children aren't seeing the kind of action where they are. And thank God, right now, there's a place where parents can go. They can appeal to the federal government. The Department of Education, the Office of Civil Rights, has to be led by someone who takes this seriously, who sees the calls for justice of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender youth as valid to seize the crisis that sees the problem. It was widely reported when Mrs. DeVos's nomination was made, widely reported that her family had given support, significant support that she herself, significant support to discriminatory, extremist, dangerous, and hateful groups that promote ideas that say a child who is gay is somehow lesser than a child that is not. Groups that have supported things like conversion therapy, something that has been resoundingly condemned. Dangerous ideas that are hurtful to children. With all of that, with all of the articles been written, this was a chance for Mrs. DeVos to sit before the American public knowing that these concerns are out there and it's understandable, even if she doesn't hold them, it's understandable that this was a moment for her to allay the fears of the thousands and thousands of children who are being isolated and hurt by bullies, of the people that are being facing assaults on their dignity, children who are, have suicide rates that are in, unconscionably high parents who are mourning their kids. With all of that swirl, the hearings were her chance to set the record straight, 
to say, I will uphold the value and the dignity of those children. But more than that, I recognize that there's a crisis in our country. And, and, and that I will work through the Office of Civil Rights to do something to address this evil in our country that has so many kids being hurt and harmed. This was her chance to go beyond just denying that she believed in conversion therapy, to go beyond just words and asserting that she values equality. This was her chance. It should have been understood that because of the record and the charitable donations, that there was a degree of suspicion, that there was an understandable degree of legitimate fear that she would not continue the courageous work of the Office of Civil Rights in combating discrimination and harassment and physical abuse of children across our country. She had the opportunity. Given the fears and concerns that have been expressed, I would have hoped that she would have spoken directly to the work of the Office of Civil Rights to protect lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender teens who are factually experiencing some of the highest levels of hate crimes and violence and bullying of any children in America. That she would have made some affirmation that she would be a champion for their equality, for their dignity, and the Office of Civil Rights would continue its needed work. But she didn't. I hope that she would stand up and say, we have violence on our college campuses. That right now, silence is allowing insidious realities to exist. We have a problem with reporting rates, we have a problem with those reports being made and not taken seriously, that she could have used that as an opportunity to speak against what's happening to an unconscionable level of young women on college campuses, something we would want to happen to none of our daughters. To make a pledge that the Office of Civil Rights would not just continue campus advisories, but that would fight to hold those college campuses accountable but she didn't. For students and families across the country, this may not be a celebrated part. We may not all know in America that the office, the Department of Education, many people don't even know they have an office for civil rights. But for so many families, with children on college campuses, in preschools, in grade schools, in high schools. The Office for Civil Rights has been the difference, the difference makers between injustice and justice, the difference makers between violence and security, the difference makers between who we say we are as a nation, liberty and justice for all, and experiencing a terrible, awful lie. I, I feel compelled to speak out on the vital importance that the education secretary, regardless of party, regardless of background, I feel a personal responsibility to ensure that if I cast my vote as a senator, that whoever takes that office will be tireless in the defense of all the rights and privileges and liberties of our students. Because I personally stand here today because of the role of the federal government in enforcing civil rights laws. 
I stand here today because of the courageous federal laws that were put in place by re bipartisanship, Republicans and Democrats. Great battles on this floor for civil rights and disability rights, for Title IX protections for women. I am a product of these kind of fights, of the federal role when it comes to civil rights. I stand here today because of our collective history. I, I believe in states' rights. It's enshrined in our Constitution, but I cannot ignore the role of the federal government. Brown versus Board of Education. Perhaps one of the most famous Supreme Court cases affirming the federal role. Look, when I, I hung a picture. I hung a picture in front of my office. I, I come out of my office into where my assistant sits. And, and the first thing I see The first thing I see on the wall in front of me is a Norman Rockwell painting. There is this young girl in that painting, and she's striding proudly to school. And behind her, or racial epithets. It's a tomato smashed against that wall. She, this little girl, God, her courage. A little girl named Ruby. Ruby Bridges. And there are these white men surrounding her walking just as tall. And they're escorting that girl to school. And there's clearly hate swirling around. You look at that picture and you can feel it, but I don't care what your background, what your religion, you look at Norman Rockwell's painting as I made sure I do every day that I leave my office as a United States Senator, I see that picture and I am reminded that sometimes when there is hate, sometimes when there is violence, sometimes the state doesn't get the job done. That, that sometimes the, the most vulnerable of child needs a little help, not just from a loving teacher or a loving parent, but that there is a government that stands behind her and says, you matter. I can't stand here today without recognizing that's my history, that is your history, that's all of our history, that our federal government has a role to play. And I drink deeply from the wells of the freedom and the struggles and the sacrifice. I, I, I reap a harvest from Ruby Bridges and her courage. And our country has come so far. There's so much love, so much more recognition of the dignity of all children, but come on, we're not there yet. Children are often harassed because they wear a headscarf. I just recently heard about a Sikh child wearing a turban, still harassed. A mother concerned that her kid is no more bad than another, but seems to get suspended more for the same behavior. Children with disabilities, 
parents still are concerned that even though we've affirmed their rights and dignities in law, that those laws aren't being carried out like they should. God, I, there are young women on a college campus today who question rightfully whether their campus is committed to eradicating sexual violence. With all of these things going on, we have to have champions here. We have to have people that understand that public education is a right for everyone. Some of the most profound battles in our country have been fought to get equal access for children to school so that they can stride toward that school door knowing that they will get a quality education free from bullying, free from harassment, free from the binds of hatred or discrimination that might hold them back in their lives. Now, I have faith in who we are as a nation. I know we are a loving country and a good country, but we haven't got it perfect yet. And, and so I stand here today in opposition to this nomination because I believe that we need a champion. And I wish that I had a chance to meet with the nominee. I wish that the hearings were longer. I've never seen them so rushed. But there's too much at stake right now. There's too many problems that still exist. Sadly, there still is a need for an office for civil rights in the Department of Education that is aggressive when it comes to the defense of freedom and our rights. I did not hear such a commitment from this nominee. There are millions of parents who didn't hear them, her speak to the concerns that they have about their gay child the concerns they have about their child with a disability, their concerns of their children going off to college. We did not hear that commitment. In fact, what we heard was a belief that states can figure it out, was a failure to commit to even the most basic continuance of the Office of Civil Rights. I'm glad I hung that picture in front of my office. I may not be able to get what I consider an open hearing and answers to these questions. But as I walk by Ruby Bridges, I feel I owe her a duty, and so many others, not to vote on someone who's been silent on the issues that are so critical to this country being who we say we are. There's a child, I think, that wonders, right now, somewhere in America, that's wondering if this country will prove itself true to them. They're probably enduring some things I never had to endure. They're probably worried about their safety. They're probably being put in a situation where they're questioning their worth. They probably feel alone and isolated. My prayer is that that child knows that even though 
it ain't perfect and it won't be easy, that that child somehow knows that they're not alone, that there'll be people fighting for them. Because I was taught in the words of a great poet that there's a dream in this land with his back against the wall. To save the dream for one, we must save it for all. May the Office of Civil Rights in the years to come remain vigilant, remain strong, remain expansive in their efforts. But I have no confidence it will do so under this person. And therefore, I oppose the nomination. Thank you very much. And I yield the floor.